This is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more, visit queenspodcastlab.org. All right, we are streaming live now. I'll uh, I'll put up the uh, the links momentarily. But uh, first, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Cohen. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Queen's College in the City University of New York. And uh, today I'm very happy to be part of an experiment in uh, sociology, scholarly discussion in media. Uh, we are live streaming the Queens College Sociology Workshop. Uh, and we have a wonderful guest today to uh, kick things off in this experiment. We're welcoming JP Pardo Guerra from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, JP is a physicist turned social scientist who studies markets and finance. He recently wrote Automating Finance, Infrastructures, Engineers, and the Making of Electronic Markets with Cambridge University Press. It's a book about the rise of electronic trading, a subject that many people understand is pure math and programming. He applies a sociological lens and shows us the social constructedness lying underneath that veneer of math only. Uh, JP's taking his work in new directions, and we're very excited to learn all about it. Uh, so it's a pleasure for us to meet you, uh, JP. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the invitation. Uh, so I want to thank you, Joseph. I also wanted to thank, of course, Charles, Hongwei, everyone who is here. Thank you so much. And if you're watching on YouTube, awesome. Thanks for uh, sort of tuning in. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the book that I published last year, Automating Finance, and also about the new project that I'm involved in. The, the two projects are really linked by this concern that I have uh, with markets. And that's really what has defined most of my sort of career in sociology. It's a, an interest in how markets are constituted, how they change, and how they transform the world around them. And that's something that, that I tried to do in automating finance by focusing on the way markets are built. So um, I guess we can make it a conversation. Do you, do you want slides or should I? Oh, well, I'll always say yes to slides. Uh... Okie dokie, so slides there oh, are. I think I have to make you a co-host. See, already the uh, the the problem with Zoom is becoming apparent. I'm sure this is a, a scene that's familiar to many many sociology departments. Yeah. Before we get it, I'd I, I, I'd like to take a moment just to also introduce the uh, workshop committee members. Uh, Charles Gomez, uh, Charlie, hello, and Hong Wei Xu. Hi everyone, welcome to the first uh, launch seminar. <laughs> All right. Charlie, I and think they, I accident. I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I I think I made you host of everything by accident. So can you share hosting with Hong Wei and me? Uh, just oh in yeah. Case? Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's me. I made the mistake. <laughs> I'm uh I'm uh hawking up all, all the glory. Um, <laughs> and be, before we get started too, I, I mean, I also want to say, you know, I'm a huge fan of of JP's work and um myself. I actually started off in in physics. Um, and I realized that quickly that was not for me. Um, and I, I think one of the cooler things that you bring to your, 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 your book, JP, is really sort of this like really careful um, Edinburgh kind of esque um, lens to sort of the history of, of markets, right? And it's such like a, markets are such a fundamental social science construct. Like it's one of like sort of the, like sort of like the, the, the progenitor of like traditional modern so the social science disciplines. And you kind of show how sort of like that, the sort of the, the historical development of, of these markets um, actually kind of meet up against sort of technical needs and sort of the vast transformation that kind of happened. And it's such a really, really well detailed, um, su such a great finesse uh, that you kind of apply to to like the, the case studies of both the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the, the, the comments. Yeah, that's, that's the whole idea. It's trying to understand how markets um, were sort of developed and how they, trans they were transformed via technology in significant ways and and that's that's a lot of what i tried to do in the book uh really the book is a challenge to what i think is i'm going to start sharing the 
the screen. What I think is one of the most prevalent uh, metaphors in, in our language, in our imagination about markets, which is this idea that they're simply transactional domains, that they're there to sort of exchange things and that the main function of markets is just to sort of shift things between buyers and sellers. And, and this, this idea of markets as something that is eminently transactional is something that has been dissected and criticized by sociologists and STS scholars in the past by focusing on the socio-technical makeup of markets, the way uh, the organization of markets matters, how they're densely bureaucratic in many ways. And that's really the starting point of the, of the book, in a sense. Uh, because what I do in the book is I try to think about what caused markets to automate and what made them these highly technological domains that we see today. So um, an example of these super technological domains or discussions about this, of course, is Michael Lewis's uh, book, which sold way, way, way more than my book will ever sell on, on flash boys and high frequency trading in, in the US, which is really all about how uh, technology was used to reconstitute markets, financial markets in the US, and in particular with a very moralized uh, sort of agenda. In Lewis's book, it's all about building fairer markets in a sense, sort of contesting the role of the established exchanges, et cetera, et cetera, and competing via technology in, in this sort of market world. And this is what I try to, to get at. How did we reach this point where um, markets are essentially these large technological systems distributed across the world? Um, and how did that happen in a sense? And I think that the, the take that I have in the book is not to focus on the typical actors that both STSers and sociologists have focused on, sort of managers, the sort of captains of industry, et cetera, et cetera, the people at the top of the managerial um, echelon in a sense. But I focus more on the people working in the back office on those doing the mundane tasks of building the technologies for the market at, that at the end of the day, over long periods of time, end up transforming fundamentally the, the structure of, of the system. And that's really what the, the approach of the book is. It's focusing on infrastructures and the makers of these infrastructures because they are the ones that through their invisibility but through their constant presence were able to slowly change the nature of um, the organization and i think that the canonical case so it's one of the the cases that charlie mentioned that i explore in the book is the automation of the london stock exchange because i think that that one is very interesting because of the um the details that i managed to get and because of the particularities of the case the london stock exchange was the only exchange in the united kingdom at the time throughout most of the 20th century or the second half of the 20th century uh, as such it was the only one that could be automated by law it was the only exchange that actually existed in the uk and it went from being something like this a trading floor with uh, this uh, brotherhood of traders that were meeting there every single day, a national institution that was held in the highest esteem, uh, one that was heavily sort of mediated by a number of invented traditions around honor, respectability, et cetera, et cetera. And it was coordinated by this technology of the trading floor to being essentially a, a trading screen in people's offices. And this is something that happened over a 30 year period. And it happened actually quite slowly in that sense, but also quite dramatically because of um, how, essentially because of the interventions of all these technologists that were behind the scenes, building the systems in the background that slowly eroded the cultural prominence of this trading floor. And that's 
what the book is is mostly about. It's the story of how this technology and the implications of back office work that were associated to this technology, the trading floor, led to this slow process of institutional change that culminated with fully electronic markets. Um, so that's that's essentially the the sort of gist of the book. Can you maybe uh, give us the cliff notes of, of, of the story itself, like the surprising elements or uh, things that people might not expect? So there's there's the way I approach this story uh, is through these three concepts uh, that I that I call capture, revelation, and conversion, and they're they're the the sort of concepts that I use to explain this transformation from the analog to the digital. And the key thing in this story, or the key element in this story, is that this technology, um, the trading floor required lots of work in the background to operate. At the end of the day, when you have a trading floor, people, uh, everything is just conversations. It's hand signals. It's like discrete chats in the background around how much people are willing to trade, et cetera, et cetera. But those conversations need to uh, become transactions at some point. And this becoming of transactions requires a lot of clerical work in the background that consists in matching the orders to buy and to sell, the, the agreements that are made on the floor. And in the 1950s, a lot of that was done by hand and it was extremely expensive because you required hundreds and hundreds of very well-qualified clerks working in the basements and alcoves of the stock exchange, matching the transactions of the day. And these were expensive individuals um, because they were uh, folks that had to be sort of trained into the profession, trained into dealing with the large volumes of trade. And actually, as the volumes of trade increased in the post-war period, they, they became less capable at handling the increasing volumes of, of activity on the trading floor. So what the stock exchange did was it decided to mechanize this back office, this process of settlement and clearing, because that's something that was very uncontroversial. Putting technologies on the floor was a big no-no. That's a, that was strictly verboten because it implied changing the cultural core of the organization, but putting things in the basements that just automated the work of these clerks was something that everyone accepted. And uh, of course, as they started automating, they realized that this mechanization of the back office implied incorporating into the organization people who would keep these machines in order. Because initially, like actually like most places, they leased a lot of the computers. They didn't own the computers outright, they just leased them. And it, it became clear that this, the depending on the vendors, for service and maintenance was not the best solution for the market because vendors would not be as responsive as the stock exchange ideally um, would want them to be. So they initially started bringing in these small armies of individuals to keep things in settlement in order uh, that were seen as the lowest of the low in the organization. One of them uh, calls himself or recalls being essentially sort of plebs within the stock exchange. You have to think that this is England. Uh, it's a highly classed organization. They couldn't use the same bathrooms as the members. They could not sort of access the same spaces. They were in service in a way. Um, they were essentially the, uh, the people at the lowest level of the organization. And so they were largely invisible because no one really cared about them. As long as the computers worked in the settlement department, matching the orders that were made on the floor, uh, they could do whatever they wanted. And the stock exchange wasn't the most technologically savvy organization. So when they went into automation, they really bought the most expensive things because as a an elite institution, they wanted to have the best of the best. So they bought computers that were um, sort of too much for the market. And what these techies did, what these technologists that were working in maintenance in a sense did was put these technologies to use. 
So one of them uh, recalled that the LSE knew nothing about computers, and to cut a long story short, they spent a lot of money on this machine, a very new ICT, and conveyor belts and stuff like that. It was as if they designed, it, was, it were designed by someone who'd worked at Ford Dagenham become, because their idea of automation was to shift paper from one end of the building to the other one on a conveyor belt. All this mainframe did was a sort of very basic process control. And for them, that was an affront. These were folks that were working with the most sophisticated computers of the time, commercially available, and they were using them to just move paper around in the building. So the first thing that they did was use this excess computing power to automate something that was a little bit closer to the floor. And that was the dissemination of prices from the floor to the offices of brokers and market makers. JP, uh, um, before yeah. you uh, move on, um, can I ask the, uh, the uh, composition of the uh, computer guys at that time, you know, how much percentage of women, you know, um, ethnic, you know, um, you know, groups, that kind of uh, stuff, so you it's, know? It's, yeah, so it's spot on because actually they have very poor memories. Uh, so all the people that I interviewed were men. They tended to have some sort of background either in industry or to have been associated to the communications activities at the end of the war. Uh, some of them were trained in, um, in sort of the emerging technologies related to um, sort of booking for air, airlines, which were very important at the time. So they all came with these different backgrounds. Lots of them, or every single one of the ones that I managed to interview were men. They didn't remember women, but I know for a fact that there were lots of women employed by the exchange in automation. And... And this really matches uh, the sort of work that has been done in the history of computing on how there was a transformation in the composition of computing and programming around that time. And I think that this story is, is in a sense, very reflective of that because the, the guys forgot about the women and they completely erased them from history. And it's quite horrible. Actually, this is one of the first technologies that they produced. So what they did is they took this old system from the previous slide, this uh, guy with the top hat writing prices on a whiteboard. That was the technology that the stock exchange had. It was very non-digital. It was very sort of naive. The fact that the guy has a top hat is already an amazing sort of uh, symbol of how class the organization was. And they developed a system that provided these prices by um, sort of computer. Let me see, something happened. There it is. Um, and that communicated at least the most common prices of, on the floor to folks in their offices via a digital computer. And this was one of the computers that was used in settlement that was not used uh, at its full capacity. Uh, and what is funny about this photo, so this is a photo ex that goes exactly to your point um, when it was published by the Financial Times, they called the woman there, Sylvia Briggs, a, uh, a clerical worker. She was actually the project manager for this. Uh, so, so they had to do a little retraction that was, of course, forgotten and hidden in the newspaper a week later, uh, saying, oh, yeah, by the way, the woman in the photo in last week's uh, piece on the stock exchange was the project coordinator so, or the project manager. So there was a lot of um, sort of change in that respect within both the oral histories of, of stock ex exchange technologists and the composition of the organization. So they started developing these systems. Uh, the first family of systems were systems that communicated prices from the trading floor near real time. Uh, as they grew in numbers, they started creating their own niches within the organization. So they weren't associated only with settlement or with property and maintenance, but they started sort of carv carving these new organizational units that were still very low status within the organization, but that afforded them more possibilities to develop things. Uh, they continued sort of producing systems and subunits. They, by the 1970s, they had 
uh, units that were explicitly about research and development, that were thinking about the introduction of new systems. And in the 1980s, I mean, by the 1970s, they had grown from a handful to about 500 technologists working at the stock exchange. And by the, the 1980s, they had this momentous opportunity to transform the markets when the British government um, sort of forced the stock exchange to deregulate. Um, and as part of this deregulation, one of the ideas that the stock exchange had was to transform the way people traded uh, by uh, introducing market makers into the, the sort of operation of the trading floor and revamping the trading floor in its entirety. Uh, so the techies at this moment had this amazing uh, moment to demonstrate their prowess. They introduced a whole new family of technologies including things like this screen. This was one of their inventions. And these were technologies that fundamentally shifted the way finance was done in, in the stock exchange. Why? Because they had managed to surround every single aspect of the trading cycle of the trading process through technologies that in a sense replaced the need for this trading floor. The designer of this system, it's called a trigger screen, uh, said this uh, in the day after deregulation, after they introduced all these technologies in what is called Big Bang. This was 1986. So he said, I was told this by one of the dealers I knew quite well when I visited him on the floor in the first or second day post Big Bang. He said, Christ almighty, by the time I wander around the floor and find out the prices, they all know it in the office. They are ahead of me. Um, when he said to me, they are ahead of me in the office, in living memory, this had never happened before. I knew that the days were up for the floor, and indeed they were. By 1987, the floor was all but abandoned. So how, what did they do? What did these techies manage to do over this very long process? They sort of captured the organization. They managed to uh, essentially erode the centrality of the trading floor and the, the need for a trading floor by creating all these things in the periphery that eventually challenge the, this cultural epicenter of the stock exchange in a sense. And, and this, is, this is what the story really is all about. It's, it's the story here in the US too, uh, as it was in the UK. And it's about this slow, um, transformation of markets through actors that are often not considered to be uh, extremely powerful, but that in the long run have these sort of monumental seismic effects on the shape of these uh, systems and these organizations. That's that's really like, I mean, those whole history is, is really fascinating insofar as it's almost, if I were to kind of phrase this sort of like revenge of the, the, the plebes or revenge of the nerds, I guess, in some way, that it was sort of the people who are sort of relegated to the grunt work end up sort of completely disrupting um, sort of these century old sort of uh, time honored traditions, maybe not century old, but sort of like these like very, very sort of regimented established kind of setups. And, mm -hmm. you know, one thing that I'm actually, I'd like to hear uh, maybe you kind of comment on a little bit is sort of just the role of automation in general. I mean, so automation now is very much top of mind. Um, automation came early, I guess, to to uh, markets. And in some ways it was, I guess, a bit of a happy ending, um, uh, you know, a bit of an underdog story for these, these plebs. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, are there any other parallels to sort of an other industries where you see, um, I, I guess, sort of a traditional, a similar upheaval? Or is it something that was just very unique to these, uh, these, uh, th these exchanges, both in London and in New York? So that's, that's like a really fascinating story. And I have, uh, or it's a great question. And I have a sort of feeling that, um, I mean, I think that this process happens elsewhere. I think that we often don't realize the, the power of invisibility. That's why that's the title of one of the chapters, because in critical moments, invisible actors that, that have these um, sort of apparently fringe roles in organizations can be the ones that drive, in a sense, the, the way um, the organization reconfigures itself. And you can think of that right now in 
in the, in the midst of the pandemic, decisions on whether to implement Canvas, Moodle, or Blackboard, which were largely say, yeah. seen by, by lots of faculty as, oh my God, that's a really non-secretor of a discussion, uh, are now actually fundamentally important because they go into sort of the pedagogy of the virtual classroom. So, so these decisions that were really flingy 10 years ago and that everyone was seeing as, oh, that's, that's fun. If you want to do that, that's okay, but I'm still printing my syllabus, uh, <laughs> are now actually fundamentally important. I, I remember when MOOCs were were, were declared um, the end of brick and mortar in the early 2010s, like 2011, 2012, and that quickly faded away. And lo and behold, um, uh, no one would have expected that IT workers and you know the every, university's um, uh, information offices are now sort of core to the function of of modern universities right now um, yeah. to varying degrees of success. But I think that's actually like a really, really kind of great uh, that that very salient kind of a grounded metaphor that we're all struggling through right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the, the moment that we're living as a crisis in the same way as the crisis of 1986 for the organization is one of those moments where people can sort of rethink how automation is, is playing a role in, and not only automation, but uh, more generally information infrastructures are playing a role in their everyday activities. Um, Was there a single... Okay, sorry, go ahead, go on. Go ahead. <laughs> do, do you think, this is kind of related to Charles' uh, question. Do you think this process of automation uh, helps decentralize the uh, global financial power, like uh, from London to, you know, like uh, New York and uh, elsewhere? Or do you think there's a uh, initial, you know, decentralization, but as this uh, technology, infrastructure of automation becomes so advanced and so sophisticated right now. Like there are only a few pioneers like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. New York, London, or maybe Tokyo's, they kind of like uh, seize the global financial power and for other like uh, developing countries, it's really hard to catch mm -hmm. up with this process. Well, actually that's that's one of the really fascinating things about the, the automation of, of markets the markets that automated first were the ones in the fringes. So the system that eventually transformed uh, markets in London, a stock exchange called TradePoint that was created by dissidents of the London Stock Exchange, uh, was a stock exchange, in, an electronic stock exchange created for Toronto, I mean for Vancouver. Uh, Toronto also automated before all the other major stock exchanges. Sao Paulo was automated before all the large stock exchanges. And that has to do with the fact that in those settings, automation was something that, because of the lower volumes, made sense to control costs. So there you have a very classical story of automation because it's a cost thing. Um, but so, the, so what you end up having is this really interesting interaction between uh, what could be considered quote unquote peripheries in the financial system and the core, and then ha how that goes back into the peripheries and then back into the core. And it tends to be more of a pendulum than, than a moment of, of either decentralization or centralization. And a, a good example of this is how the, the fight for high frequency trading has changed dramatically in the last uh, 10 years. So when I started out this, this project, High Frequency Trading, which is this, this very, very sophisticated technique where you essentially buy and sell stocks in micro fractions of a second, um, was starting in, in finance. And it was largely driven by small companies that had the technological prowess to sort of fight against the exchanges and the large stockbrokers. But of course, after a while of competition, profits started disappearing. And uh, whereas initially profits were in the order of 10 billion a year for the industry in high frequency trading, now they're in the order of 1 billion, which is what a, a large hedge fund does in six months. So it's, it's not really a lot of money for an industry. And now most of those activities have been absorbed by the large um, sort of investment banks. 
So the pendulum, which was in, in these like small nerds that were entrepreneurially changing the system has now gone back into the large investment banks who control essentially now the structure of the markets. Doesn't okay. Really okay, so <laughs> hi everyone. Um, I have a follow up question. Um, um, so I just I was wondering how the um, the workforce has changed. You know, so as Hongwei was suggesting, maybe one way is the de decentralization, but also you know what other aspects of the workforce change, like composition, skill level, education, etc. So in, in, in the finance world, at least with the, the technology side, it's become much more professional. Um, so the, the stories of all these techies uh, tend to be of folks that had some experience in, in, in computing and telecommunications, but they didn't have full-blown computer science degrees, for example. Uh, now it's a much, much more professionalized uh, world. And the um, since the nineteen the, the late nineteen nineties early two thousands you've seen more for example degrees that are offered for people who want to go into these specific areas. There's more uh, activity in terms of professionalizing the techies that work in finance. So now it's 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 much more difficult to access this than what it was in the eighties. So when the London Stock Exchange was at its uh, sort of largest in 1986, 87, they had about 3,000 IT staff. And most of those IT staff were people who had, were people who had worked with um, sort of the, the telephone company or with Olivetti. One of them came from Olivetti, for example. So they came from all these very different backgrounds. This is something you wouldn't necessarily observe today in in finance, uh, at least in, in the technological side of finance. The other really interesting thing is that all of this automation was predicated or was sold as this is going to make transactions cheaper, but it hasn't made transactions cheaper. And actually the number of people employed in the financial sector today is larger than what it was in the 1980s by a lot. So the the workforce in finance as financialization would lead us to sort of imagine has just grown um and it's it's also not made necessarily anything cheaper or more efficient i, I have a question from the internet from uh daniel morrison of abilene christian university he wants to know where did the formerly face-to-face -face information go under automation? Presumably there was some type of communication on the floor that fulfilled some function. What happened to it? So one of the things that is interesting about this invention, for example, is that the techies were really, um, really uh, avid or really sort of, uh, really sort of able in, in terms of deciphering how people use the trading floor. Uh, so what this screen did was it signaled changes in the stock price through color. So if a stock price was going down, it would be red. If it's going up, it would be blue. If it's uh, stable, it's green. And the interesting thing is that this managed to be as effective as noise was on the trading floor. So this didn't substitute conversations, but it substituted noise. Because one of the things that you had on the trading floor is that if everyone is talking, that means there's a lot of activity. And if you look at the faces of individuals on the floor, then you can say whether the, it's a bear or a bull market. In this case, you could just do it by looking at the screen. So this was very effective at substituting that experiential aspect of the trading floor. Of course, the other things still happen. One of the interesting things with this automation is that a lot of uh, transactions still occurred over the phone and people would have conversations over, over the phone, phone and they would try also to avoid or break anonymity, which was integrated into these systems. When they moved on to digital systems or electronic systems like this one, uh, you would no longer trade with people, but with firms. And that was something very uncomfortable for lots of traders. So what they started to do was um, sort of 
using their networks, signaling trades to particular individuals by using odd lots and and in a sense trying to break that anonymity to preserve all this more interpersonal form of communication that happened on the floor before. So it didn't disappear, it just moved into other spaces. I have a question, uh, it's like a follow-up question about the workforce. Did the technical people gain more and more power as it became more automated? And are they driving decisions now or, or driving the decision-making power? So one would expect that they did become more powerful. So they were more powerful. Uh, this is like a fun graph. They were, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, there it is. So they were in the leadership of the organization at the London Stock Exchange by the 1980s, the mid 1980s. So they had people representing them in the board of the stock exchange. But then when there was a crisis in the market in 1987 and the organization started losing money, uh, the techies suddenly lost all their magic and their power and they were fired en masse essentially. So after 1987, the stock exchange started eliminating technologists as fast as it could and transferring most of the technological development of systems to Accenture or what became Accenture later on. So they were powerful as long as they made a profit. The moment that they didn't make a profit, all the power disappeared. Um, so this, this, and this is something that still happens today. So uh, lots of folks who are sitting on the technology development side in investment banks and, and in their own sort of smaller firms have less power than the front office people who are bringing in clients and, and sort of command these huge commissions on trades and deals and so forth. And that's an imbalance that has remained in, in finance uh, for forever in a sense, yeah. I, I have a question about the, I guess I was, I was a little surprised. I mean, in terms of automation, uh, you more or less stop in the 90s, is it? Because it seems to me that the big thing in automation, I, a friend of mine uh, was at the Federal Reserve Bank, so I used to have lunch with him and down on Wall Street. And the thing that I found about Wall Street, particularly during the well, sort of 70s, 80s, 90s, even into early 2000s, is you go down to, if you go down to Wall Street in the 60s, in the 70s, you'd see many, many people on the street, mm -hmm. you know. But by the time you get to the 80s, 90s, 2000, most of the trading, not not the uh, not the trading, what you're talking about, but the actual decisions of trading and the tra way trading was done had become machine driven. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are many, many, you know, there were all these computer methods of actually trading. And in fact, for a while, uh, I don't think they allowed anymore, but people were patenting trading strategies that were implemented by like often by sun workstations and so um, i think one of the reasons that the costs have gone up is that you know the financialization effectively is a zero contributes zero to the economy in a certain sense i mean yeah. it's basically and so all these companies are trading i mean the bit the most uh probably the biggest example of that is renaissance technology which, uh, which actually they finally wrote a book about it called uh, The Man Who Solved the Market. And it was developed by a mathematician who had been chair of the math department at Stony Brook and had won the field medal. And he went on to, or maybe it's a Clark Bell, no, it's field medal. He went on to basically set up Renaissance technology. His partner was Mercer, who unfortunately decided to support Trump. But they basically did not allow money to come in. Mm -hmm. They were completely run by the money of the employees. And they didn't actually say how they were doing it, but they weren't also very hot to hire people who had finance backgrounds. They hired people in math backgrounds and physics backgrounds, things where they would look at pattern matches. So that's really not part of your story, correct? So that comes up later. So the, the thing is, there's a couple of books that are coming out that do deal with those types of developments. But I stopped the story, uh, not in the, in the 80s or early 90s, but with the introduction of 
the device that is necessary for the types of trades that Renaissance has. So one of the things you need in order to be able to do algorithmic trading and all this computer driven trading is something called a limit order book, which allows you to submit your orders into the computer and then the computer matches them automatically. Something that does sort of this, let's see if it works, it should work. Yeah, so it has like the prices on the on in the computer and then you submit in order to sell or buy something at a certain price and it executes it automatically and what is important is that those things or those um, practices like the ones that renaissance and algorithmic trading and high frequency trading uh, are into depend on the existence of this this technology so this is what allows markets to fully automate in a sense to fully extract humans from the the picture and what I do in the book is I go into the story of this device and in the case of London what is interesting is that the first one uh, the first device the first uh, limit order book was introduced by former stock exchange technologists after they were fired by the stock exchange who decided to set up their own exchange and this was before Renaissance because at the time with the technology technologies renaissance wouldn't have been able to do the type of trading that it does today uh, but with the intervention of these techies they opened the floodgates for those forms of automated trading so i stopped the story in the book a little bit later when they managed to in a sense fundamentally change the structure of the market by introducing this thing the the order book and then there's like a bunch of folks working on on the on the on what happened after that and how speed became the the name of the game in a sense. We have a question from Ryan Sperry. Ryan, uh, hi. Um, actually, Gary kind of asked the question I was going to ask about leadership being affected by that, but I've been thinking about it a little bit since the answer. And um, would it be fair to say that? This reminds me of a little bit of institutional theory in the sense that like the technical core is changing uh, over time. And I was going to ask what the effect on leadership was. But as you said, the leadership changed and kind of reflected that technical expertise and those computer computing professionals a little bit. But then as soon as they hit a rough patch in terms of profits, mm -hmm. they were all out and replaced by, I guess, more typical kinds of CEOs again. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe do you see this as kind of a, uh, a, a proof almost of the institutional kind of theory approach that the technical core is isolated from the, the structural, the formal structure in that sense, or is it, I mean, cause that's not going away, right? The technical core, they're still doing computing. They're still doing this technical stuff you're talking about, but as soon as there were like, a, there was a loss in profits, the leadership kind of didn't want to be associated with that maybe formally. Yeah, so so I think that it is something that speaks very much to this, to to institutional theory, and I think that it depends a lot on the specific case. So again, in in the case of London, you have this this rise of the techies within the firm, and then when there's problems, they are disbanded. Uh, also, within normal firms, what you would tend to see, even when they were partnerships, is that the partner associated to technical things, settlement and clearing, was always the most low status partner in the sort of firm. So there was always a moment or there's always been the, this distancing of the technical uh, in, in financial organizations. What is interesting with the US case, for example, is that they explicitly built things by creating a firm that was owned by the exchanges, but that did not have um, sort of a direct connection with the organizational structure of the stock exchanges, so that technology would always be under control. So whereas in London, the techies could rise within the ladders of the firm, in New York, technology was always something that was outsourced in a sense, that was kept at arm's length. And this, this really is um, sort of a good descriptor of, of a generalized pattern in finance where even if technology is important, um, it's always important to be able to uh, distance yourself from technology 
because in a sense it does challenge fundamentally the role of, of key actors like traders, uh, fund managers, et cetera, et cetera, who rely on a lot of relational work and their positions within the, the industry in order to make profits. We have a question from Elena Veselinov. Elena? Yes, I, I was just wondering as Andy was talking and you know you were talking also about the changes uh, taking place. So is algorithmic trading more profitable or maybe it depends on the types of trading or you know so I just I was just wondering about that. So on the on the whole, it's not more profitable. At, at least the form of algorithmic trading known as electronic market making, which is where you buy and sell, very very fast to to provide liquidity to markets that's that tends to be um, more like running a casino in the sense that you're you're playing against very small uh, odds but you're betting on huge numbers of transactions so in terms of profitability what i always like to think about is hedge funds and the fact that if you go to a hedge fund and you invest a million dollars in a hedge fund you know that just because you're putting the money into the hedge fund, you're paying about five points or 5% of the investment uh, as commission. That is much more than what any um, sort of algorithmic trader would ever imagine to make out of a single transaction. So as a, a source of profits, algorithmic trading is actually really, really small. It matters because it's what allows you to trade. So people have to invest in algorithmic trading because it's what allows them to change their portfolios, to buy and sell in the market without taking as much of a hit as they would if they were doing it through traditional means. Uh, so people, it's now sort of a necessary part of trading strategies, but in terms of profits, it's actually not terrifically um, uh, profitable and it's, it's becoming less and less profitable over time. So are you saying that actually, you know, the algorithmic um, trading is, is, is more of um, just minimizes risk rather than increase profit? Yeah. And it's not only risk minimization, it's also uh, sort of reducing the amount of information that you're leaking. So what algorithms do very efficiently. So, for example, if you go into the market and you say, I want to buy a million shares of um, Apple, everyone will say, oh, well, you really want to buy, so I'm going to give you the highest possible price for those million shares of Apple. What, so you lose money because people know what you really intend, what you really want to do, and they give you a price that is adverse to what you want to do or what to, is adverse to that particular transaction. So what algorithmic trading does is that it breaks transactions into little pieces that leak less information. So instead of saying, I want to buy a million shares of Apple, you tell a million different people, I want to buy one share of Apple. And they'll give you a better price because one share doesn't really reveal a lot of information. So- Oh, wow, that's, that's fascinating, huh? So, that's so it's where, like a, a arm race situation, right? So at a time when only a few firms are doing that, they can make big money quickly. Right, but now since everybody is doing it, things go back to normal. And if one firm does not doing it, then they will lose money quickly, right? So, so, so is that a good uh, 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 the picture of what's going on? Exactly. So that's that's essentially what is going on. So, so now those investments are necessary because if you're a firm. Uh, that has any credibility in the market, you need to invest in systems that will uh, try to reduce those information leakages uh, as much as possible. So, and if you don't have them, then you're, you're going to pay more for your transactions. Uh, and because everyone has them, the profits out of those systems are actually very, very small. I'd, I'd like to follow up on, on uh... Speaking about credibility, uh, one of my predecessors here at Queens College, Charlie Smith, often emphasized how uh, technical aspects of Wall Street were actually marketing efforts that were dressed up as uh, 
as as technical, but they were in purpose. They were their their purpose was often to communicate to potential investors and attract funds. How much of this technological arms race that you see in finance is uh, marketing driven uh, rather than uh, driven towards you know the the more practical purposes? So I think that there is a lot of marketing in in what we're seeing. So for example, discussions about artificial intelligence in in finance tend to be very iffy, um, and it, that's essentially because of speed. So one of the one of the things that guarantees a good system in algorithmic trading is speed. And if you want to do artificial intelligence, anyone who's run anything related to artificial intelligence on a decent computer knows it takes eons to run the data, to process the data. So, so for example, uh, these claims that there's firms that are doing Twitter analysis or social media analysis to predict stocks uh, are completely marketing because that takes so much uh, energy and so much com computer time in a sense that it's completely inefficient in today's markets. Uh, given their speed. So there's a lot of, of, of this going on and there's a lot of, of ways in which uh, marketing has been essential to also push the, the, the sort of aura of technical innovations in finance. The, the folks that left the stock exchange, this is a great photo of them. Uh, the folks that left the stock exchange to start the, the new stock exchange in London, TradePoint, uh, had this sort of Photoshop in GQ, Britain, and they dressed themselves up like uh, Steve Jobs because that was what sold. And this is like a really mid 1990s image that is all about marketing and not about the system. The system was actually really not sexy in a sense. It was a computer, a PC with a uh, sort of glorified uh, spreadsheet in a sense, but they sold it in very different ways. They sold it as something that was interesting, fantastic, amazing. Oh, oh that was so good. Okay, wait, That's we have good. a question from Christine. That was so good. I enjoyed that so much. Uh, we have a question from Christine Rosales. Christine? Hi. <laughs> so in your discussion, you were talking about um, how they were leasing the equipment and also bringing uh, companies in to uh, basically run the tech. And then there was a transition back into bringing employees in and the amount of employees grew. Um, do you see more recently that they're bringing the techies in and keeping them in house? Or are they moving to more of a hiring consultant or companies to do it for them, which then changes the dynamic of powers with techies too? Yeah, so there's a there's there's several combinations. Uh, there's firms that that are dedicated to provide systems. However, because the setup of the system is very very specific and very proprietary, lots of firms decide to internalize that today. So, so now it's more common to just buy the systems and develop them internally. Um, than than what it was before. So when they were dealing with settlement, settlement is very um, it's, it's like very non-controversial and there's not a lot of magic behind that. So uh, making that something that you would uh, do via a vendor made sense. But when you're dealing in today's world with trading strategies, uh, controlling everything inside the firm is really important. Uh, and actually what the, one of the things they do for that is they silo a lot of the development of systems so that no one has an idea of how the entire thing works. Because if you have knowledge of how a firm's entire trading strategy and entire systems are structured, that is extremely valuable. And you can, of course, be poached and, and there's problems with that. So now it's much more common to see this internally. And what you also see is large investment banks like Goldman Sachs, who have explicit arms that invest in new technologies so that they have control over those technologies into the future. And they have a division that sets up new exchanges, funds the creation of new exchanges and new, new forms of tech, even though they challenge their partners, because in the long run, those might be the ones that, 
that uh, end up dominating the system. So, so you see more control within uh, large organizations of the technology. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, so JP, um, I, uh, I, this your book and all of the studies actually really fascinating and it really hits home obviously because we're in New York City so this is sort of like a hometown uh, thing for us. Um, I also want to give you the opportunity to talk about some of your future work um, and some of the cool things that you've been working on. I know you and I kind of had a uh, some some brief exchange but where wh where where is the sort of the the progenesis of, of this project? What kind of directions are you going in? So uh, finance is is something that I'm starting to leave in the past uh, because I, even though it's been interesting and it's been fun, I'm uh, starting to study markets that are closer to home. And one of the markets that I'm really interested in is the marketization of knowledge or the marketplace for ideas and how we experience that as academics. And the the newest project, and this is, I mean, I have to write it, but it's 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 hopefully a book that will be out at some point in the next decade or so. You heard uh, it here first. <laughs> <laughs> is is a book on on rank, rankings and markets in British academia, and the context for this is um, these the quasi markets that define the lives of lots of British academics and. Since the 1980s, British academics have been sort of uh, faced with a proliferation of audits, assessments, evaluations, metrics of different forms that define their value and the value of their institutions. Um, if you've talked with British colleagues, you might have heard about the research assessment exercise, which became the research ex exercise framework. And these are really involved uh, interventions into the world, uh, the work of scholars. Um, and they're quasi markets in many ways because what they effectively do is they assign a value to people's outputs, to people's productivity. So every five years or so, this is the most in, insane experiment you can imagine or, or a process you can imagine. In order to distribute uh, research funds, the UK government asks all the departments of all the public universities in the United Kingdom to submit four uh, outputs per member of staff, per faculty in a sense. Uh, and then these are read in panels that go through the outputs as we would with student papers, for example. And then they're ranked uh, from four stars, which is world leading research to one star, which is recognized nationally. And the funding that departments receive and that institutions receive in the future depends on these stars. So it's almost like a market process of valuing people's work in very specific ways. So what I'm doing with this is exploring these markets or these quasi markets and their effects on knowledge and the type of knowledge that we produce. Um, and and the question, in a sense, is how do they change the way social scientists write about the world, think about the world, et cetera, et cetera? Apologies if you hear a hen in the background. That's <laughs> that is our source of breakfast. Uh, so uh, the the way I'm doing this is by looking at the the effect of rankings or the effect of these market-like devices on on the mobility of scholars in the United Kingdom and then on the type of things that they produce. And, and this is where, where there's a lot of overlap or a lot of synergies with Charlie's work because I use uh, computational methods to look at the productivity of, or the products, the articles of British social scientists across anthropology, economics, politics, and sociology. Um, using Web of Science, I have this uh, longitudinal data set of, of where people were throughout their careers. Uh, we have about 4,000 uh, scholars in the data set that were active across these different disciplines from the 1970s to the present. And we, of course, have all the abstracts associated to their papers. So we can do all these really interesting things on modeling the field, looking at differences in productivity, differences in the style of writing, differences in the topics. 
and and it's it's sort of revealing what we found is is giving us a story of of markets transforming fundamentally knowledge and i'll sort of like show you more or less what it, what this looks like so this if you take the the so if you compare departments in terms of their topics by using um, topic models, which are now increasingly used in computational social science, you can try to create a metric that tells you how distinct departments are between themselves and how distinct a scholar is with respect to his or her departments. So you can come up with all these different measures of the distinctiveness of scholars, the typicality of departments, and whether scholars are evaluated or not, this idea of categorical dis dissonance. Uh, if you have, for example, a very, very um, sort of underperforming individual in your department, you can decide not to submit him or her because it would affect your, your ranking at the end of the day. So you can be uh, unevaluated. Or if you're working in, for example, an anthropology department, and you are a sociologist and you are submitted to the anthropology panel, uh, you're, you'll at the end of the day be evaluated by people who are not your epistemic peers in a sense. So you're also dissonant in that respect. And what the, the models of mobility show is that these three things are very predictive of mobility in a sense. So if you're, if you're very redundant within your department in the UK, you're more likely to move into a different department in the next evaluation. So if there's like four people doing uh, economic sociology, one of them is very likely to leave in the next evaluation. If your department is very, very typical, you are much less uh, likely to leave. So the, the graph is, is not completely clear because the, the scale of typicality is, is not apparent there, but if you're in one of the most central, typical, ideal departments, it's it's a very stable position to be in the field. And if you're not assessed with your peers, you're also very likely to change departments and move to a department that matches your field of practice. And what this ends up doing over time is something that you can think of as a market-driven form of matching, in a sense of epistemic matching, where the labor market via sort of mobility and via the signals of these evaluations uh, sort of sorts scholars across the field and creates departments that are over time increasingly similar. Um, and indeed, when you look at the levels of similarity in departments across the UK for all disciplines, they, they have become more similar or less dissimilar. Uh, so if, if you want sort of a contrast, we always pick on economics as being uh, a very homogeneous discipline. In terms of how departments are structured in the United Kingdom today versus how they were structured in the 1980s, sociology is comparable to today to economics in the 1980s. So we are the new, or they are the new economists in terms of diversity and typicality. So, so it's something that has had effects on the organization of knowledge. And there's like a couple of new results that have to do with comparing the, the sort of semantic universe of different disciplines and showing that they are becoming increasingly similar that discussions about, for instance, class that were more polarized in the 1980s are now much more sort of homogeneous, that understanding of concepts, understanding of discussions of relevant literatures is, is more consensual today than what it was before. And that to some extent, this reflects the experience of scholars who go through these markets uh, or these evaluations and who feel that they have to fit in particular ways. They have to fit the discipline. So if I understand this correctly, it's like the system is producing more output, but of the same kind of stuff. So it's becoming yeah. more like widgets, mental yeah. widgets that they're making. Yeah, yeah. 
That's very clever. And on top of that, also wiping out di- diversity of, of ideas. And I, I know, I, I think we're kind of ending the bewitching hour, but I, 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 I will talk to you more about this, but I think there's a lot of stuff in my own work that's kind of following similar trends, um, uh, but ac- across internationally as standards actually become much more homogenized and in particular more Americanized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, and that's the whole problem that at the end of the day, what happens is that you lose some of the diversity that existed in the, in the system and that was extremely sort of beneficial. You had very specialist units yes. like Birmingham, for example, uh, that gave us cultural studies. But now that is much less possible because of these types of evaluations. Because if you're in a specialist unit, it's more risky as an institution. Uh, so it's, it's better for you as an administrator to just have a very standard department with the individuals doing the standard bits of the discipline that are seen as being uh, a value. It's funny. There is there is a sense of like just a general tw- trend towards quantitatively more stuff yeah. with maybe questionable impact in terms of the entirety of uh, what's being produced. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. All right. We're at 121. I, th- I think that Can we I have to adjourn. Have tra- no. no, go. Of course, Conway. Yeah. Oh, this this cultural market is, is is so fascinating because in China it has emerged, and uh, uh, it, it, it feels like almost the same cultural market. Yeah. And uh, uh, one dark side of this cultural market is that because it's a government agency mm-hmm. who is evaluating the academia, and so they, it creates a negative incentive. It creates an incentive for certain individuals or even departments or even schools to you know to, to perform scientific misconduct you know yeah. I, I wonder if if you have uh, your similar <laughs> similar issue has appeared in the in the British <laughs> causal market no no so I haven't seen misconduct I've seen weird behavior so for example one is that people publish more they break up publications a bit more to sort of have those four outputs, even though four outputs in five years isn't undoable. But one of the weird things that I've heard in interviews is that people delay books. So so actually, instead of motivating people to publish things that are interesting, maybe as a book, this exercise uh, sort of it produces incentives for people to time their publications in very specific ways. So books tend to be things that people sit on so that they don't have two books in one period of evaluation, but only one. So they break up and they strategize how to publish in ways that both reduce the um, sort of diversity of the fields, but also in a sense, um, make for publication patterns that are very artificial. Well, that slows down the pace of scientific production in that case, if people are sitting on publications. Uh, particularly of books, yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. All right, I I think we have to adjourn because uh, everybody has to go. Uh, JP, thank you so much. This was yes. this this was wonderful. Thank you, thank you so so much. This was a huge, massive pleasure. Uh, yeah, the pleasure right. was all ours. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to end the live stream. So let, let's end that. View stream. Okay, I don't know how to stop the live stream. Hold on. I could do it.